All right, here we go. Uh, you are, let me see, that's not you guys beeping, is it? Okay, I don't think it is. All right, what you're looking at is uh, Aptasia morpha texensis. Uh, this is a very small sea anemone, uh, less than a centimeter wide. And I ordered a whole bunch of them from uh, Gulf Specimen Labs in Panacea, Florida. Uh, which, by the way, if the pandemic uh, ever comes to an end, uh, you could uh, certainly go down and visit. It's a neat place. All right, checking something there. Uh, it's a very neat place, and they've got an aquarium uh, that's open to uh, the, the general public. They don't do dolphin shows or any crap like that, uh, but they just really show you very nicely what's in the uh, uh, what's in the waters off the coast of northern Florida. Uh, they're in the town of Panacea, which is up in the Panhandle, um, roughly due south from Tallahassee. Uh, which is where Florida State is. And they've got their own, you know, they've got display aquariums open to the public, and they also uh, ship live critters um, across the country to researchers and teachers. And I ordered a whole bunch of uh, Aptasia morpha texensis, uh, which is what you're looking at here. Um, I'm going to try putting a little bit more light on the subject. Uh, this is a very small anemone, but you can see the, um, uh, you can certainly see the tentacles. Uh, you're looking at uh, this particular one from the side. There, let me see if this improves matters any. Okay, maybe a little bit. Oh, because there's a nerve net, but no single brain, uh, any kind of stimulus to the anemone causes the entire critter uh, to contract. Um, so, yeah, if they get spooked, then the entire anemone um, shrinks up and pulls its tentacles in. Um, and then slowly relaxes as those two ciliated grooves called the siphonoglyphs uh, pump water back in and cause the anemone to reinflate. And that's what this one is doing um, uh, rather slowly. So we've got one there, and I've actually got a little rock right here that is pretty much covered with them. Uh, these are common organisms in what we call the fouling community. Uh, they cover uh, rocks. They'll cover wharf pilings, um, you know, the pieces of wood in the water that, um, you know, support piers and docks and things like that. Okay. Right in the dead center right there is some kind of small arthropod. I'm not quite sure what. Uh, but there's a thing in the middle that looks like a shrimp. And then right next to it, if I can figure out which way to move the dish, there. There, we've got a fully extended Aptasia morpha texensis. Uh, you're looking right onto the oral disc, and the tentacles surround the oral disc. And if anything stimulates them, um, they will shrink in and they'll pull food particles in. Now, the lab that we're going to do, um, I've got to modify it a little bit, but I'll be giving you this in a handout uh, by the end of the day. Now that I can see what I'm doing when I write, it'll be a lot faster going than lab three was, is we want to look at uh, nematocysts. Uh, we want to look at the stings. And specifically, we can look at what causes nematocysts to fire, uh, because I mentioned earlier that nematocysts um, are expensive to make. Uh, they're energetically costly, and they don't 
do much good if you fire them when you come into contact with a rock or a sand grain or something like that. There's no point in trying to sting those. So it's not adaptive to fire only if you're touched. And in fact, we know that anemones have chemoreceptors, and we also know that they have mechanoreceptors that respond to vibration. Uh, in fact, it's those mechanoreceptors that actually have the same structure as the uh, hair cells in your cochlea uh, that enable you to perceive sound, you know, which is kind of neat. You know, it's almost like, uh, you know, it's almost like life shares a common ancestor or something like that. Crazy talk, I know. Uh, but there it is. And that's why anemones have actually uh, uh, attracted attention from researchers into uh, hearing and hearing loss. Um, I think I mentioned this uh, gentleman, uh, Dr. Watson at University of Louisiana Lafayette, uh, that actually found some repair proteins that anemones use uh, to repair their mechanoreceptors and at least in preliminary experiments, it looks like they can also work to help repair uh, mammalian uh, hair cells in the cochlea. So some basic anemone research might end up leading to better treatments for certain kinds of deafness, which I think is really cool. But what we're going to look at is chemoreceptors. And what I've got is um, I made some unflavored jello. Uh, last night, and while we were waiting, while y'all were waiting, uh, I was cutting the jello into little blocks, and I've got the blocks soaking in four different solutions. Um, I've got jello blocks soaking in distilled water, and I've got jello blocks soaking in um, uh, about a 0 0.1 molar. Uh, solution of the amino acid proline. Now, since amino acids are present in proteins, duh, and proteins are present in things that anemones like to eat, uh, it is a reasonable assumption that these will fire uh, when they come into contact with, with proline. And in fact, I've done this in the past with a different anemone species uh, called Eptasia, uh, Eptasia pallida, uh, and it's actually worked quite well. Um, I am assuming it will work in the same way with the smaller uh, but cheaper uh, Eptasia morpha texensis, uh, but I don't actually know. This is kind of an experiment for me because I've never worked with this particular species before. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, um, okay, so we've got distilled water, and 0.1 molar uh, proline, and then a 20% dilution of that, and then a 20% dilution of that. Uh, so we've got a control, which is distilled water, and then three different solutions of the amino acid. And these little blocks of jello have been soaking in there for about 30 minutes now, and uh, they are should be, by this stage, permeated uh, with the solutions. So what I'm going to do is touch a jello block uh, to the tentacle of an Eptasiomorpha anemone, hold it there for uh, five seconds, and pull it away. And what I will then do is take the jello block, squish it on a microscope slide, and look at it under a compound scope. And what that will do is this. The stings, the nidae, are actually quite easy to pull out, and they will get stuck in the jello. So what I can do is simply count, or have you guys count, uh, the number of nidae in uh, the jello block, and use that to directly measure the sting response. Um, our null hypothesis would be that there won't be any difference in the number of stings in the jello blocks uh, between the jello block that's in distilled water and the jello block in the different solutions of amino acid. Uh, that would be our null. I can tell you that this works pretty well with uh, Eptasia pallida, uh, that they do sting a lot more 
um, the blocks that are soaked in proline uh, much more than the blocks that are soaked in distilled water. But again, I don't know that this will work with Aptasia morpha uh, because this is a new species for me. So what I will do is get the anemone to uh, touch the gel blocks to the anemone tentacles. And I will um, uh, put the jello blocks on microscope slides and video those slides under the um, light microscope. And what you'll do is watch the video and try to make a count of the number of um, uh, the number of stings uh, that we see, the number of nidae. So I'm going to go ahead and give that a shot, and I'm going to adjust the lighting uh, just a little bit. And try to get a nice fat and sassy anemone in my sights. Yeah, that'd be a good one. All right, fortunately, I've got several, but I have to do this with a different uh, anemone each time. And I'm trying to get one in position where we can actually, I can actually see what I'm doing. So, focus, focus. There we go. There's a nice, happy, uh, yeah, there's a couple of nice, happy anemones right there. There's actually something else moving in there. I'm not sure what. But right there will be our first experimental anemone. And... I will start with a distilled water block, and if you'll excuse me for one second, I need to get slides and some cover slips. Right, so slides, cover slips, and I'm going to try to pick up, and in practice this can be tricky because these are delicate, but there, I've just dropped a cube of uh, jello. All right, I'm holding, and I dropped a cube of jello. And I've actually tried doing this multiple ways in the past, and it's handling the ah, handling the jello is the biggest pain here. Rather slippery stuff that jello. Okay. What I'm gonna do is And I'll drop the jello again. Right. There's the anemone. Okay. Okay. Note to self. Next time. Do not try to save the department money, just get big anemones. Okay. Um, uh, 
Okay, there I've got... Ah. All right, one moment. We're going to need a second pair of tweezers. All right, let's try it like this. Let's not try it like that. Okay. Holding on to the block and dropping it. I'm going to touch this to an anemone, and I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. But I've just put it on the anemone for five, lift it out, and put it on a microscope slide, and I'm going to squish it. And if everything has gone well, uh, that block of jello should contain um, a certain number of stings. Okay, what I'm now going to do is get another one from the jar that has a high concentration of proline. This is a very famous, famous amino acid, of course. So famous that Dolly Parton, of course, wrote a song about it. Proline, 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 proline. And if I grip it that way, it just falls. Okay. Just picking up these cubes of wet jello is a tricky part, but I'm going to try to stick one onto one of these anemones. And I pulled it off and dropped it on the floor. Um, right. I'll get another one. And stick this on one of the anemones. Four, five. Pull it off and get it onto a slide before anything bad can happen to it. Okay. So that gives you some idea of what I think I'm doing. And I'm going to pause for about five minutes just to switch the scopes over. And we'll see if we can find nematocysts. And what I'll probably do then is uh, dismiss you folks. and You can go, you know, go home. Uh, but I'll stick around here. I'll look at the other uh, concentrations and I'll take the video. Uh, and what you'll be able to do is do some nematocyst counts. And that way you can't hear me internally screaming as I drop these bleeping uh, jello blocks. Uh, so I will go ahead and stop recording temporarily.